YouTube and we're just going live on Facebook hopefully if that actually goes through so guys if you are coming on and if you're on to YouTube already please um, it's always the way somebody messages uh, please like on YouTube so it helps us get the algorithm going and it gets us uh, noticed and pushed by Facebook so if you can like and you can comment that would be fantastic if you're coming on to Facebook, if you could like, comment, and share, oh, let me just do that, it does wonders for us, so um, just take a second, like, comment, and share, and we're going to be looking at the Akita today, we're going to be looking at Genesis 22, we're going to be continuing somewhat on from Sunday's message, where we started on to talking about the 5783, the, the Jewish New Year that we're approaching on um I think it's the 25th of September this year. Um, so as we're doing that and as we're going to be looking at that, it's uh, there's an awful lot. It's not just something you can share in one message. So we're going to be taking it from the Akita, from Genesis 22, and reading through from there. Um, smile while you still have teeth. <laughs> um, uh, as, it just, as it just points out with the teeth, I have a toothache at the minute, so please pray that that goes. Um, that would be really handy if you could actually just pray against that. I hate the dentist with a vengeance. Uh, no disrespect to any dentist, but um, I will do my own dentistry rather than go to the dentist. So if you could pray that I don't have to go to the dentist and that uh, the nerve deadens. And I, don't, I no longer feel it. That would be fantastic. And guys, again, make sure you're saying hi. Hi, Gary. Hi, Simon. And make sure you're saying hi as you're coming on. Hi, Lily. Um, so, and again, please, if you're on Facebook, if you take a second to share, that would be fantastic. Um, I'm just trying to do that myself. And here we go. Hopefully this works. Um, hi, Stephanie. So guys, just take a second, just share, like, and comment. We are going to get started. Open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22, and we're going to go look at this, and we're going to give a prophetic look, continue with the prophetic look for the year ahead. Um, and there is a convergence, as we find for the last couple of years, between the Gregorian year that we're going into of 2023, Hi, Adonna, and the... Jewish New Year of 5783 that we're going into. Hiya Trevor. Guys, if you can just do, do me the favor of just like, share, and comment as you come on, it'll be working wonders for me. Um, Kelly, if you're on, if you can uh, on Facebook, please go on Facebook, Kelly, and if you can share it for me, that would be great. Hiya Helen. Um, and guys, we're going to look at this. So without further ado, let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for your message tonight. Lord, I thank you that you are in charge of it all. That you bring out exactly what you want to say. That this is, isn't just a guy speaking to the screen, Lord. But rather your spirit speaks through me. And it's not me at all. It's all of you and none of me. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So we're going to look at this. And to give you a, a, a brief background. On Sunday we talked about the rise. 573 being the rise of the spiritual camels. And what that is about is in the sense that a camel is the, the animal that can walk through the desert completely filled to the brim with water and still carry the sustenance of life. And we are to be those people in scripture who are by the whale, by the, the uh, you know, we have the ever spring in John 4, 14, ever spring and bubbling over so, so life, new life, Holy Spirit emanating through us. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi, Roberta. And as that is the case, it's really important for us to make sure that whenever we are uh, getting ready for a year coming up, as if we're coming into a new year. Now, we're I know that most people think of the Gregorian calendar, but, you know, our faith is rooted in the Hebrew calendar and we have to take the context of that. How you do? And so as that's the case, we look at that and we go, what is the Hebrew year saying for us? And we're currently in the month of Elul. And Elul literally means to search out. It is the month of searching. It is the month of Teshuvah. It is the month in which we have to seek. Are we going in the wrong direction somewhat? You know, and if we're going in the wrong direction, we have to repent. Teshuvah, we have to repent. And repentance is a literal change of direction. 
So as we approach Rosh Hashanah on the 25th of September, it's really important that, you know, Rosh Hashanah, I said on Sunday, starts with the letter Resh, and it's the head. It's really important that we seek out that God is head of this year, that God is leading us and directing us. And there's a lot in this year, but the big word that I gave on Sunday is about the rise of the spiritual camels, and that this year is a test to some degree. And nobody likes the word test, um, unless you're a nerd like me, nobody really likes the word test. But the test in the Hebrew is slightly different. I want to see this in the first verse of Genesis chapter 22. So bear with me on it, right? So it says, Now, it came to pass after these things. What things? Well, Genesis 21, you see a covenant developed in which Abraham enters into a covenant and the well of Beersheba, the seven oath well, and it's about God being your source. It's about relying on God. It's about connection of who dug the well. And there's a covenant relationship there. And then God wants to say, to, or says to him, now you're going to be tested, Abraham. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Now the word test there in the Hebrew, we told you this on Sunday, is bakan. And I'm going to say, if you're if you're really interested in getting the spiritual message for what we're talking about, and it's extremely important. You know, we've done these last year, the year before, the year before that. And I, every time we do it, we see a prophetic unfolding. And it's a hundred, it's see, up till now, everything that we've studied has been 100% accurate to foretell a prophetic picture of the year coming. So I would say delve in and press in on these studies, right? So when you look at the, the word backhand literally means to examine, to investigate, and to search out. So if God, if it, you know, it says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the world, looking for whose heart is loyal to him. If God is to look at your heart right now, are you loyal to him? If he searches you out, if he investigates you, if he examines you, are you found to be living in him and him in you? Or are you one foot in the world and one foot with God? You know, it's it's a question, and this year will certainly test that. This year, God is wanting to see who is really for him, who is really relying on him. And you might go, well, what if I mess up? What if I get it wrong? What if I lose my temper? What if I do this? What if I do that? It's not that type of test, right? It's a test to see whether you're going to be... <sighs> part of the chosen. Now what that, that means, now don't take that as some sort of mystic thing, it's not. Matthew 22 and the marriage uh, parable, the wedding supper, the wedding parable, the, the scripture goes in verse 14 that many are called but few are chosen and basically that is many are, God calls all of us but not everybody answers the call. Not everybody goes, yes, Lord, I will come. Here I am, Lord. Inve examine me, investigate me, search me out. Whatever you bring up in me, uproot it and pull it out. Does that make sense? Guys, I need interaction on these, so please comment. Please hit one if it makes sense. It's an easy way to do it. And just let me know. I need interaction because I've done this before and I've preached to a screen and not realized that, you know, the sound's gone or the screen's frozen and nobody hears me. So the more interaction, the less distraction for me, right? So whenever you're looking at this, look at Abraham's response. So God tests Abraham and Abraham and says to Abraham, and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Now that, when you look at this, is the response of anybody who successfully navigates the backhand, successfully navigates the examination process of God. You see this throughout scripture. In 1 Samuel 4, Samuel is woken up with a voice, and the voice is God speaking, and God says, uh, it calls him Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel wakes up and he says straight away, here I am. Now he thinks it's Eli calling him, but he responds with that same response. Here I am, search me out, break me if you need to break me. Even though it may scur me to a certain degree, the idea that I could be broken, I would rather submit to you, God, than actually be part of this world system. And I think that that's something that we've got to grab hold of, right? You know, if you go further, if you look at Isaiah, 
Now, Isaiah's calling in Isaiah 6 is a phenomenal calling, right? In Isaiah 6, he answers the call of God and he has the vision of God in the throne room and the train of God's robe just fills the room and there's coals and there's seraphim angels with the six wings flying around the throne of God. And one of the things that happens when Isaiah is searched out is he feels the meekness and the weakness before God. Now, he feels the physical weakness, but true meekness is actually power under control, right? Matthew 5 verse 5 says the meek shall inherit the earth. And there's a part of being meek before God that actually allows you, if you think about it like this way, like a, a, a medieval knight needs to take the knee before they're knighted, right? Before they rise to battle. It's that process. And Isaiah is, is in awe of God. Now, that's one of the things that... um. We spoke about on uh, Sunday, we're in a, 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 a seventh year cycle. Yes, we're in a Shemitah cycle, but it's a Hekel year, right? Hekel. And Hekel is literally a time within Hebrew custom that every seventh year on the Hekel year, which we're coming into in 5783, the king would gather all peoples, right? Men, women and children, strangers, people who just needed to hear the word of God. And he would gather them into the synagogue and the king would be the one to deliver the message. Now, why wasn't it the high priest? Why was it the king? He would he would open the Torah and he would read to them. Well, it was the king because the king is receiving from the king of kings. And it was that connection of saying, look, those who represent authority in the worldly realm take a knee to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And there would be an awe about the word of God. And this was the response that we saw in Isaiah. Isaiah feels this awe about the, you know, being in the presence of God. And then what happens? A seraphim is directed by God to go to the, the, the altar where the coals sit, the burning coals. And he lifts a fiery burning coal and he touches Isaiah's mouth. And Isaiah's mouth is now made to be able to speak out the knowledge and the wisdom and the word and the power of God. Right. He saw himself of unclean lips. And in the natural, he was weak. But because God inspires the, the, the power and gives him the power to speak out Holy Spirit inspired words, he is now transformed to being an amazing prophet. Right. Now, this is something that we see in the 83, the 5783. So 80, we know we're in the decade of the pay. And pay is literally mouth. It is by no mistake that we've said this since 2020, that there was a, a physical assault upon Christendom, to sh and a physical assault upon the world to shut the mouths of everybody. Put, put a mask over your mouth. Don't speak. And then shut the doors of the church. Don't speak. And why? Because if anybody was part of the mentoring group last night, we were talking about this. I said to you in Revelation 19.10 that the spirit of uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And part of walking in the spirit of prophecy is prophetically acting something out before it occurs. Right. So behaving. It's, it's the walk of faith. I believe that I'm walking towards the promises of God rather than being distracted by the world. Even though I don't see it, I'm going to walk as if it's already done. Now. The enemy is an imitator, not a creator, and he copies the same strategy. So what you've seen since 2020 is a, a spiritual attack upon the mouths and the ability to profess the truth of Scripture and the truth of being blessed by the, the living word that we have. And shut the mouths of the prophets, shut the mouths of people, shut the mouths of them all. Don't. And in fact, it goes further. If they say something on media, if they say something on social media, we will censor them, we will shut them down, we will close them down. Well, that's a physical prophetic act before we see the spiritual implication of it. And the spiritual implication of it is that people will be fatigued and stop speaking out truth. Now, we will see that in the sense of 2 Thessalonians 2, where it's called the great falling away. Guys, I've gone off on a tangent, so if I'm not making sense, please let me know. But if, you, if you're getting this, give me a one and give me a comment, please. This is a time in which, you know, we're seeing a prophetic act that has happened for the last couple of years to try and overlay a spiritual principle of shutting the mouths in the year and the decade of the pay. 
Now the thing that's connected to that, we're in the, we're coming into the five, seven, eight, three. And the 80 and the three, the three is the gemel. And the gemel is pictured, I've shown you this before, it has a valve. Um, let me draw for you. It has a valve and let me see. It is a little bit like that. Right, apologies, I cannot draw, but if you can see that, it's a little bit like that. And remember, the screen will be back to front somewhat, so on at least one of these. But a gamel, it is literally the process of walking, right? And it also, we talked about this before on Sunday, if you get the three first letters of the Aleph Bet, the, the, um, you got the Aleph, right? So it's the picture of God, God the Father, number one. You got the picture of the Biet, and the Biet is the is the tent, but it is also relative to the sun, right? And whenever you've got the Father, the Son, and then you get Gimel, it is the Holy Spirit. So part of walking in this year is a picture of in the midst of the test, can you speak out and profess as the Holy Spirit commands you to speak out and profess? If what comes out of you, what comes out of the mouth should be what is in the abundance of the heart and what should be in the abundance of the heart. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If, if anybody has caught on to this, one of the things that was brought up last night was in France, Emmanuel Macron. And Emmanuel Macron has called it the end of abundance. This is like the, a time where it's the end of the abundance. And that may be a case that they're trying to push forward in the, the, the physical. But if you look through prophetic guys, I'm telling you right now, it is not the end of abundance. It is realizing that you have a covenant with the one who dug the well. You have a covenant with the one who built in you an ever springing up fountain of ever living waters that you will never thirst again. That is who your covenant is with. So whilst he may say it is the, the end of abundance, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and the abundance of our heart should be full of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense, guys? All right. I need to get back on the topic. Right. But I just want to give you the, 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 the principle here. In, in the midst of the bacan, our response needs to be. Here I am. Here I am, Lord. Examine me. In 1904, you had Evan Roberts, right? I talked about these things before. We've had the the the. the Welsh Revival of 1904, the Zuzu Street Revival 1906, you have the Sunderland Revival in 1907, and then you've got revivals happening and breaking out all across the world, and these big awakening that all these generals came from. But in 1904, the big thing that you take from it is there was this guy, Evan Roberts, and in a little prayer meeting, he prayed, he prayed the prayer, Lord, bend me. And that's a picture of meekness. That's a picture of examination because when God is going to bend you, he's going to examine you. And what I'm saying to you is Evan Roberts opened himself up in that prayer meeting to be examined by God. Now, I'm going to ask you right now, are you ready where you are, where you're sitting to just simply say, God, examine me, examine me, test me, look into me and whatever shouldn't be there, Lord, uproot. I am meek, I am lowly, I am nothing before you. Take the Isaiah approach and let him awaken in you a mouth to speak purely Holy Spirit driven uh, and dictated speech and to be led by the Holy Spirit. So I, I want to ask you, are you ready to do that? Because it says in Matthew 22, verse 14, that many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now that that whole scripture should shake you to the core, because in Matthew twenty two, it is the parable of the wedding feast, and what happens is servants are found unworthy. Now they're not they're not found unworthy because they've messed up and they've done something wrong. They're found unworthy because they are refusing to get ready for the wedding. They are not dressed right. They are not clothed right. They're not suited and booted for the return of the bridegroom. And at the same time, they're not about the kingdom business. And so what God does in that, because if you look through that parable, what God does is he switches out. So some people who are professing that they should be at the wedding feast end up in the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
And this is where the scripture comes from in verse 14. And he says, many are called, but few are chosen. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be chosen. And how are you chosen? You go, here I am, Lord, examine me. We have been sold an absolute, and quite through the media, a twisted form of Christianity for so long. A twisted form of Christianity that says, look, do you know what? It's not about, you know, you, you know, you can take a Christian political stance, but it's not about you and your walk with Jesus. In fact, you know what? You don't need to worry about your sin. We have hyper grace. We have all of this stuff. No, look, true repentance and we're called to repent is turning away from that lifestyle and going after God. Does that mean that we never trip up and never fall? No. Psalm 37, and you know I love Psalm 37. The steps of a good man are directed by the Lord. Even though he may fall, he shall never be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him in his hand. And it's really important for us to make sure that if you're wanting to be chosen and not just called, because you can hear it, you know, you all remember when you were out and playing when you were kids and your, your mom would come to the front door and she would call you for your dinner. And quite often you would try and ignore what you know the, her voice and put your fingers in your ears or pretend it was someone else's mom because you were too busy playing. Well, here's the thing. Here's the wake up call. Church, stop playing. We can't afford to play because time is increasing. Time is unfolding. Prophecy is converging. And time is short. Time is short. We are in the, the, the we're coming into the 5783, which is the, excuse me, the tough she pay gamel, right? The five, the seven, the eight, and the three. The tough she, the pay gamel. And the tough she pay gamel is actually an acronym that gives us, and I told you this on Sunday, so I'm just, I know I'm repeating a wee bit. Um, it talks about the Shafer Godel, right? The Shafer Godel, it's an acronym of the tough uh, she, Pay Gamel, right? The 5783. And the Shafer Godel is literally the long shofar. Now you've seen, we have a shofar that we keep in church, but the big, long, long one. Now why is that important? Why is it relative to Genesis 22? Because in Genesis 22, the test that Abraham will go through will be the, the binding and the sacrifice of, his, of the, the, the putting the son on the altar and putting the son before God. And then in the midst of that, God provides the answer he get it, there's a ram stuck in the bushels and the ram is stuck by its horns so in the midrash in in, in hebrew the in, in judaism the midrash tells you that what abraham does yes he sacrifices the lamb but he takes the horns one of those horns was used to call the congregation together to blow the shofar and call the congregation together for the delivery of the law in mount sinai then the second one is about the gathering of the people. Now, in a lot of uh, 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 Hebrew teaching, they teach it in the sense of uh, the calling back of the people to Israel. But I'm talking about a spiritual blowing of the trumpet, right? Where it's calling you to gather together and to receive from God, to humble yourself before God and to be all about pressing in. Because this year and what we're going to see is further division right we're going to see not just the world and the church but you're going to see fragmented parts of the church break off to the point that you've got church that is married to the world church that is embroiled in wickedness church that has let their love grow cold church that is dead inside a church that is faithful and a church that is lukewarm what i'm talking about here well, it's the seven churches of Revelation, right? Revelation 2 and 3. And you're going to see that fragment. And as you see it fragment, it's because people are not gathering around the source of, of the word and not gathering to God. They are blowing their own trumpet. It is by no mistake that 2 Timothy, the whole book of 2 Timothy has 83 verses. Pegamel, 83 verses. And 2 Timothy, I'm going to read you a portion of 2 Timothy. Just bear with me. I'll read you a quick portion of it. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. In other words, you're going to see I personally believe over this next year, the development of more and more twisted forms of teaching. I, I heard yesterday of an Episcopal, Episcopalian church that is um, supplying a gender transition care for children. That's an Episcopalian church supplying gender transitional care for children. In other words, Children who are they're encouraging to transition into different sexes, they're supplying the cur. Now, it's one thing the world doing it, but the church, that's a, that's a completely different level. Now, whenever you see these things, you have to actually go, oh my goodness, is that in the word? Is that according to scripture? No, because the Bible tells you in Psalm 139 that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. God did not make a mistake when he made you. And therefore, we got to stick with what God has made. And at the same time, you've got to realize that as this is happening, these are churches that are going down these paths. Churches that are adopting things like critical race theory and saying, you know, OK, we'll have a space over here, but that space should not be invaded by another race or that. What? Completely counter to scripture. This is man's idea of applying social uh social ideology to the scripture and twisting it and breaking it up and god is saying you can gather around that or you can gather around his work is this making sense guys please let me know hit one if it's making sense because the next verse says in genesis chapter 22 then he said this is god speaking take now your son your only son isaac whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, his only son, we know that technically that's not, it's not correct. Technically, there is another son, there's Ishmael. But he's saying, he's, he's what God's doing is directing Abraham that Isaac is the source of your promise. I don't know, Isaac is the the... What's the conduit of your promise? The promise will be brought through Isaac. And so he's saying, look, you're not going to get your promise of the your seed being like the sand of the earth and, and the stars of heaven and covering the earth and providing redemption for man. You're not going to get it through Ishmael. You're going to get it only through Isaac. And I want you to put that on the altar. I want you to put it on the altar. This is, so in, in one sense, I personally believe that Abraham knew that God was somehow going to step in and stop this and stop the sacrificial act. But he knew that by his faithful action, what he was doing was becoming a living sacrifice himself. Because he was putting that thing, which means the most to him in the physical world, the thing that he had longed for for so much, a son of his own, and he's putting him on the altar. And that's one of the things that God requires of each and every one of us, that we put on the altar that thing which we kind of hold above God. That whether that's a, a business, whether that's your own, you know, social life or, you know, whether it's your family, your spouse, your friends, whatever it is, God requires for us to live like a living sacrifice and for us not to have anything above him. That's a, that's a hard word for people to hear. People like to say, yeah, God's number one. But then can I ask you, if God is number one, what do you spend the majority of your day doing? I'm, I'm being honest, right? If the majority of your day is spent, you know, trying to make your physical life more comfortable, if the majority of your day is spent talking about others, if the majority of your day is spent, you know, watching your favorite programs, or, you know, maybe it's 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 about speaking to people that you really love and, on the earth. If that's the majority of your day, then can I just be very, very blunt? God isn't number one. 
Because if God is number one, he will be involved in every aspect and every step, Gemel, every step that you take. Make sense? So this is the thing. He, he, he requires this of him. He requires that, you know, yes, that we are examined by God and he examines Abraham to see, you know, what's what do you need to put on the altar? And this is the thing that will happen this year. God is examining each and every one of you to see what you are holding above him. And he's requiring you not that he is a, a cruel God in any way. He is a loving father. He's not saying he'll take anything away in that way. He's saying, look, you can't have these things above me. How do I explain it? Right. Isaiah 20, Isaiah 25, verse 4 says that the, the blast of the terrible ones, the evil ones, is coming against the wall. And Isaiah 26, verse 1 tells you that God makes wall for salvations, for, for your salvation. So if you imagine God's, uh, where's that? I don't know if I've got anything here, right? If you imagine, oh, I can't get my books out. That you've got a wall here, right? And this is the salvation that God has given you, right? So this is your salvation. You're going to go to heaven. This is your salvation that you're redeemed. This is your salvation that he gives you restoration and all of the promises of God. Your restoration, your provision, your health. Psalm 103 verse 3. You know, you, you have all of these, right? Now, the minute you start to go, right... I, if you stay behind this and you stay completely behind this and that is your walk and that you're always looking at the wall, you know that your the wall is your salvation, then the enemy can come against you. But the reason that God doesn't want you to put anything above him, because the minute you start to go, well, my business, I'm just going to concentrate on my business. My business comes first and then I'll get to God. Well, you're putting your business above your salvation, that God is your provision, and you can guarantee that's going to be attacked. So God doesn't want you to have anything above him. In fact, he wants you to bring it all below him so that God is number one. And that's maybe not a great analogy, but I, I, I'm just trying to point it out to you. Does it make sense, guys? If you have to keep interacting with me here, because if it goes quiet, I will, like I said, get distracted thinking that I'm on my own here. I want you to understand there are two trumpets going to blow this year. There is the trumpet and the, or the shofar that is gathering God's people into a more tightly knit unit that we are stuck, we're standing behind the walls of his, his and bulwarks of his salvation and his promise that is supplied for us and that we can walk forward with strength. And then there is the shofar or the, the trumpet of self. You know, you've heard the term, uh, oh, that person likes to blow their own trumpet, right? Well, those people, you know, people do, they blow their own trumpet. And that's why it says, 2 Timothy verse, or chapter 3, that in the end times they will be lovers of self. They like to blow their own trumpet. Well, look at me. Look at what I've got. Look at, you know, my family are my key. My, my social time are my key. You know, the biggest thing that I like is, you know, the money I've got to spend. Or, you know, oh, these people and how they look at me and all that. Listen, you cannot blow your own trumpet and gather at the feet of Jesus, you have to be called and then choose to listen and go, here I am, examine me and bend me, Lord, and then use me. You can't be a lover of self and a lover of God. God say, uh, Jesus says you can't serve both God and mammon. You can't have both uh, two masters. Now, mammon, yes, is translated as money, but mammon is also uh, seen in theology as the worship of self. You can't worship self and God. So prosperity gospel, here we go, complete and utter load of nonsense. The idea that, you know what, even when I give into the basket, it's all about what I'm going to get back. I'm sorry, you're twisting scripture and not getting the true nature of it. Because when we give, you don't give to get back. When we give, we give cheerfully because God has already given to us. And when we give anything, listen, I don't care, you know, if anybody gives a penny or a hundred pound, it doesn't make a difference. It is the act of giving cheerfully, Right. And this is the thing, is the prosperity gospel, load of nonsense, people go, well, I just give and then I'll be blessed. And then, you know, this will happen and that'll happen. And honestly, do not treat, do not treat him like a slot machine. 
That's being a lover of self. That's looking to try and gain favor and try, trying to gain uh, increase through your relationship with God. That's not a real relationship. Now, will God increase you? Of course he will. He increases the size of your tent. He gives you your needs. Matthew 6, He gives you your needs. He supplies your needs. Philippians 4, 19. But you don't give for that reason in all senses. So how does sacrificial living occur? It's, it's all about letting him remove that which is profane, right? So if we're meant to be on fire for God, we can't have a profane fire, right? There's a, there, there's a story of profane fire in the book of Numbers. And it's, it's this false fire that, you know, you're, it's not truly ignited by God. Because the way fire is ignited by God is by you submitting and actually taking a knee to God. If you look at 1 Kings 18, Elijah sets the sacrificial uh, elements and he, he, he douses the, the, the sacrifice with water and then God strikes lightning down and burns it all up. So in other words, if you want to see the fire of God in your life, it starts with sacrificial living. And the 5783 is going to require that of you. I'm telling you right now that what you will see over this next year is the enemy trying to get you to blow your own trumpet. And what God is requiring from you is you to come to the call of his trumpet. Does that make sense? The enemy is going to use circumstance, use catastrophe, use problems in the world to try and get you to blow your own trumpet. And God is wanting you to come to him when his trumpet blows. Two different. You can't go in two different directions. Does it make sense, guys, or am I losing you? Listen, I, I personally believe the enemy is going to use different things to provoke the self-love. Yet we are to die to ourselves. Luke 9.23. So the trumpet of self sees trouble in the world and starts to worry about yourself. The, trouble, the, the trumpet of self sees hardship in the world and starts to wor worry about you, yourself and I. The, trouble of self, or the trumpet of self sees uh, what others have got and then starts to think about yourself and covet it. Now, the enemy is counting on this stuff. He is counting on it and you're going to see increase. I'm going to tell you a few things and bear with me right now. So the 5783 will coincide with 2023. We've talked about this. We give a message at the start of the Hebrew year and we give a message at the start of the Gregorian year, the Gregorian calendar. And there is a convergence between the two. The two do converge. Now, if you look at this, what uh, one of the things that you'll see in 2023, 23 is a number associated. I'm going to read, um, this is from my friend's book. It's a really good book. It's worth uh, reading. So um, I'm going to look at this, the number 23. 23 literally is in the positive in scripture is presented as being in the presence of God, right? In the negative, however, it is death. Now, last night I talked about, I'm going to say this, um, if, if you've got two devices with you, if, you, if you're watching this on a phone and you've got a computer, do not switch off. But if you've got the ability to Google at the same time, actually Google, Google it, the Deagle Report. Some of you will have heard of the Deagle Report. It's, um, it brings up a whole load of questions about what's happening in the world. It's D-E-A-G-E-L Report. Now, the uh, Deagle um, Organization Institute is, uh, is part of the U.S. Military Intelligence. It is a minor group of the U.S. Military Intelligence. They write reports. They wrote reports uh, in regards to North Korea and the action of the U.S. government for North Korea and how they should act. But the reason this is important is if you look at this, this isn't conspiracy nonsense. That's why I'm saying you can do this right now. The Deagle Report, and it will bring up projections of world population decrease by 2025. Now, I, I've got it on this phone that I'm actually on YouTube with, so I can't look at it. But these projections are 
really and the natural could be scary right um they're saying that a 77 percent decrease in population between 2017 to 2025 in the uk will happen the population of the us is meant to drop according to the deagle report from 320 million in 2017 to 100 million by 2025 now why is that something for us to look at? It's, it's not for something for us to be concerned about. But 2023, 23, like I said, in the negative, in scripture, represents death. Right? It, it, it's all about death. Luke 23, verse 23. And, there were inst and they were instant with loud voices. Requiring that he might be crucified in the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus our Lord. Tw different words that are mentioned 23 times in scripture. Killeth 23 times. Hell 23 times in the New Testament. Death is mentioned 138 times, which is 6 times 23. Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. So in the negative term, what I'm saying to you is, is that I personally believe that the trumpet of self will try and save self as opposed to being that living sacrifice seeking to live for God and to be a living sacrifice for our fellow man to carry our, man, our, our fellow uh, brother and sister's burdens for them. Self is off the world and the idea that it's you, yourself and I, forget everybody else, screw everybody else, throw them out the window, it's you, yourself and I and that's it. God requires different, but the enemy is going to use circumstance, fear, anxiety, stress about things to come, whether it's future pandemics, whether it's the fact that now reports have come out saying that the effects and the fallout and deaths that will follow the results of the lockdowns will dwarf the deaths of the pandemic. Now, that's a, that's a report that I've seen on at least two major news stations in the last week. So if the, that's the narrative that is changing now, then you can see that maybe something is expected. Now, that I'm telling you, do not worry about this, right? The difference being is that even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you fear no evil. Why? Because the other side of it is being in the presence of God. Psalm 23. I fear no evil for he is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. Now, the reason I'm saying this, right? You have two trumpets that are going to blow this year. The trumpet of self is going to blow it. It's going to try and provoke you to take care of you, yourself, and I. That's it. The trumpet of God is going to blow and trying to get you to be that living sacrifice. Yes, he will supply your needs, so trust in him. Yes, if you look at Isaiah 60, he will supply a transfer of wealth. Yes. Oh, here I am. Uh, yes, he will supply what you're, what you're needing. He'll supply your health. He'll supply you and keep you protected. You can look at Psalm 91 and things like that for that. When he will keep, cur keep hold of you and keep care of you. But the enemy is going to try and shake, try and disturb you to the point to think, well, just think about yourself. Just think about yourself. This is why you're seeing, like, you know, with the, the, the fear of cashlessness. Now, listen, cashlessness is coming. We are going in step forward into a cashless society. I'm going to give you some wake up calls. Don't be worried, right? Will a cashless society be the uh, mark of the beast? No. Will it lead to a mark of the beast? Yes. Because a cashless society means that they can control you more means that they know every purchase that you have. It means that they know your spending habits so that you will no longer be an individual free in God according to society, but rather just simply a consumer that they can direct and lead and usher where they want to go. Now, the vision that God gave me when I asked him about the, the things to be aware of in this coming year is he showed me um, cattle being pushed into a cattle grid and people branding them 
And that's what Satan is wanting to try and do. He's wanting to try and brand you. He's wanting to try and get you to be self-focused. And listen, I'm not talking to the world right now. I'm talking to the church because Jesus tells us that this will happen. And people who are privy to the glory of God and the love of God will fall to this. They will falter. Matthew 24 verse 12 says that the love of many shall grow cold. Why? Because of lawlessness in the world. So the enemy tries to create all of the uh, and bring in all of these problems, wars, rumors, wars, destruction and all of that. The, the hatred of other men and the ethnos against ethnos. And so the people then start thinking about themselves and people are worried about the cashless society. I'm saying don't, don't worry about it. God is still your supply. Now. I personally don't believe we're, you know, I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I do not believe that we will be here for the mark of the beast. But I do believe that we will be here for a cashless society. In fact, the Independent wrote last year that by 2026, they expected the whole of the UK to be cashless. I put up uh, yesterday, and everybody had seen it in the news anyway, Starbucks have said that they've gone cashless. Not that they're a... Uh, uh, company that you should ever go to anyway but at that it's just understanding that there are things happening around the world but don't be directed by it instead be directed by the call of god so to put this into simple terms right you see lack supernatural act come across the world the black horse right and we're not in the opening of the seals but there is a preeminence to the opening of the seals right so revelation 6 talks about the, the four horsemen but zachariah 6 gives you those four colors and those four chariots as well and it says in zachariah 6 that they go to and fro that they're they're walking to and fro and if you take that in context with revelation 6 i would say that you know you have death you have conquering you have a uh, plague you have disease you have all of those things and lack walking to and fro throughout the earth until they're set free in the tribulation so in the midst of this you have all of this lack coming in you have all of the the, the building of a one world currency you have the building of cbdc central bank digital currencies you have this element of trying to usher in why because he wants to move you to stop living your life as a living sacrifice for God and start thinking about self. Because he knows that you can't worship God and self at the same time. Listen, do not take this, for, uh, take this lightly. The devil knows scripture. Right. He's had millennia to, to read it, to, to digest it. He knows scripture. And he knows the prophetic elements of scripture. And as he knows that, you, you have to understand that his strategy will be based around that. So if he knows that Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and mammon, then he wants everybody directed to serve mammon. It's not that he, he needs everybody serving him. Because by indirectly not serving God and not worshipping God and worshipping something else, he knows that you've stepped up from behind that wall and you put something ahead of God on his altar. And then in that context, he knows that you're of his, his small K kingdom, right? And this is something that, that people forget, right? The enemy is seeking to present, according to Isaiah 14, to exalt himself to the furthest most part of the north, right? The five I wills that you see in Isaiah 14, right? Where Satan says, I will promote myself to the north. I will, you know, be head of the brethren and so on. Well, he wants anything above God on the altar. And the whole story of Genesis 22 and the Akita is that we have everything that is dear to us on the altar before God. Saying, God, you know what? I'm sacrificing this for you. If you want to take control of it. And listen, it's trusting God with it. You know, trusting God with your curse. That's why in uh, is it First Peter or Second Peter, he says, cast your curse, First Peter 5, 7, cast your curse upon the Lord. Cast them, throw them upon the Lord. Don't have them exalted. Because when they're exalted, they're in the enemy's eye, uh, eye shot and in his target. And then you know that then that bit will be squeezed for you to get your whole self out from behind your salvation and start thinking about self instead of God. 
have I lost everybody? Are you all lost? Are you getting this? Because this is this is something to you know. Did anybody check out the Deagle report there? Did anybody have a look at the Deagle report? Because I'm going to say do right. Uh, I, it, it's really sort of telling on this because it says that if you look at it between 2017 and 2025, China's population doesn't change, but the UK's population dr drops by 77.1%. Uh, the U.S. Uh, population drops by 67%. It's crazy. And listen, the enemy is looking for you to pop your head above the wall so he gets that squeeze point, And then you start going, well, you know what? Yes, I believe in God, but God says charity starts at home. No, it doesn't. The scripture doesn't say that. Right? Charity does not start at home. And in fact, if you're a child of God, right? The first mandate or commission that we have in scripture is to go forth and multiply. And we see it in the context of the seed, right? So in Genesis, I think it's chapter one, maybe verse 20 something or other, uh, go forth and multiply, talking about the seed, right? And in Hebrew, the word seed is said, S-E-D. And it's where we get the Hasidic Jews from, right? Because when you multiply that which God has given you, it looks different to the world. And if, you, if you've ever seen a Hasidic Jew, they look different to, you know, your regular follower of Judaism, right? They look different. They stand out. We are called to stand out. And how we are called to stand out is that we operate differently. Whenever we're squeezed, we go, all right. God, I'm finding, uh, you know, this hard. I'm finding this stressful. I'm well, I'm going to find someone to bless. Or, you know, I find that if you're you're finding that anxiety, stress, fear, whatever it is, is trying to get you to be insular, do the exact opposite. Step out for God. Step out for God more and more. I can guarantee, see, whenever we do our outreaches, I am, people don't get this right, but I am always nervous. And whenever I stand up and preach, I'm always nervous. Whenever I get on on a Wednesday night or a Tuesday night and I'm preaching, I'm always nervous. You ask me what I want to do in my flesh, my flesh would say, uh, I get nervous talking to people, I'm in front of people, I'd rather just not do it. But I know that I am to multiply that which God has to, to given into me and to be fruitful and multiply. How do I do that? I'm going to give what God has given me. I'm going to speak whenever I don't want to speak. I'm going to talk whenever I don't want to talk. I'm going to go and witness and pray with people even when I don't want to or I feel nervous about it. I'm going to give, you know, to people whenever I don't have. That's why the widow's might was so important. Listen, I, I am not, like, you know our church, I don't take a salary or wage or anything like that. I have a job, right? I have a job as well as being a pastor. I have my own business and that's what pays me. But what I'm saying to you is, is so when I'm preaching this, it's amazing that I have to preface that to, to actually speak about money because I don't want to put people off. But the world has been put off by those prosperity preachers that say, you know, if you give, then uh, you're honoring the pastor and if you give more and more and more and uh, you can go without and the pastor has his Rolex and has his Rolls Royce and all of this, then that's real giving. I'm sorry, that's not. When you give, it should be given to honor the kingdom. It should be given to spread the glory of the gospel. It should be given to outreach. It should be given to feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. It should be given to those things. I personally believe that, you know, yes, every pastor is worth their wages. I believe in giving them their wages, but I also believe that from a personal point of view that I've stepped back away from that because I've got a job, I've got a, a business that pays me, praise God at the minute, and it pays me. So I think, why would I do that? Why would I take a, a, an income? And the reason I'm talking about this is because this is probably the number one thing that I hear those who are not in the church have against the church because the church is all about money. Well, it shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be. Money is a purpose, a, a way to bless others. It's crazy that that's the case. I saw, um, I don't know if anybody had seen this, this pastor in America who was robbed. Did anybody see that? 
And when he was robbed, he was robbed. Uh, he had a church of, I think, about 25 people by one report I heard. But he was robbed of a million dollars worth of jewellery. Now, that's ridiculous. I'm sorry, that is just mad that... I don't care if he had 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people in his church. You should not have a million dollars worth of jewellery. And the argument in the prosperity gospel is, well, do you know what? We are, God blesses us. Yes, but you're taking the blessing of God and equating it to money. That's not the blessing of God. Or, you know, I, I saw the same individual riding, a, he's got a Maserati and a, a Rolls Royce. That's crazy. It's just mental. No wonder the world thinks that the church is a joke because they look at the church and say, you're just like the world. You're looking after self. It should never be that. It shouldn't be about self. Now, am I against people having nice things or money or anything like that? No, I am not. But it certainly shouldn't be at the expense of the kingdom. And it really, it really shouldn't. I saw one pastor stand up recently it's again, this is in America again. I'm sorry, Stephanie, because I know you're American and you're watching this. But um, <laughs> this was in America again. And he rebuked his church for not buying him the watch that he wanted. And I'm like, what? He spent the whole of his sermon rebuking the church because he wanted this expensive watch. And the congregation didn't buy it for him. And I'm thinking... Where, where's that in the gospel? The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And yet, you know, we have pastors who are living in, you know, mansions and, you know, whole of these compounds with their own gas field and oil and electricity. And we're meant to look different than the world. What has happened is we're multiplying the same structure as the world. We're saying that success is determined by your financial gain and by your profiteering. I'm sorry, that is not the case. Success, according to scripture, is that whenever you get to heaven, Jesus will turn around and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And whenever you're on earth, if they don't remember your name at all, but they know the name of Jesus, then that's success. Success is whenever you raise your kids and you see them out in the street and they see someone sick and they run up and they pray over the person sick without question. And I am blessed to say that's success that I've experienced in our life. And or, or, or whenever your child comes back so excited, elated because they've led their friend to the Lord, that is success. Success is not based on, well, that one's got a Maserati. Oh, did you see that person's trainers? That person's trainers are five thousand dollars. That is not success. That is just the opulence and the, the, the greed of self. You cannot worship God and self. You cannot worship them both. And this year, you always, you know you know this even in the, in the natural. I have to finish shortly. So guys, interact with me. Let me know you got something from tonight, please. If you didn't, you can tell me that too, right? But whenever you're, you're looking at this, this year you're going to see such a a squeeze on everybody's finances and you're going to see people fearful you're going to see people suffer more than others you're going to see people in deeper holes than others and here's the thing the way the way the church is meant to operate is that we are meant to be an outstretched arm do you know that was the first act of when the church was established so the church was established in acts 2 the first act that we saw after the church was birthed, so the church was birthed through the preaching of Peter after the Holy Spirit had descended upon the 120, was seen in Acts 3. When Peter and John walked to the gate, uh, walk to, uh, past Gate Beautiful and they, they see the beggar there and they stretch out their arm to him. And they realize it's not about money. But it's about giving what you've got, right? So whenever I, if I've got love to give, I'm going to give it in abundance. And that's what the church needs to be. So if you want to help someone out of a hole, you could be struggling, but you see someone else struggling more. Help the person struggling more. If you could be uh, going, oh, well, I don't, I can't afford to, to sow or, or bless this ministry. 
Well, here's the thing. You've got the same mandate, Matthew 28, upon you. Go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go out and baptize. Go out and preach. Go out and speak to people and bless them. I don't know if I'm making sense to people right now, but, but honestly, this year, 5783, and even as it converges with the 2023, I personally believe you're going to see uh, more darkness in the world. You're going to see a bigger squeezing and you're going to see a, the backhand, the test. Is your faith in yourself and in that which you hold above God? Or you lay it all before God and say, Lord, I am meek before you. I am unclean of lips, but Lord, bless me because I'm in your presence. 23 can mean death or 23 can mean being in the presence of God. Watched a guy on YouTube put down Ray Comfort for preaching repentance. This, God said, the term repentance does not appear in the Bible. Uh, what Bible is he reading? <laughs> Oh, that's just, it's, it's crazy though. But this is, this is the thing though. You're seeing this nowadays that people can spout a load of nonsense because they are aware that people don't actually read the word. Amos 8, 11, in the last days there will be famine. So as we're approaching into this year, people are worried about, you know, certain countries will experience famine. Other countries will experience the lack of goods other and, and, and rollout blackouts are coming, by the way. Uh, you will see energy shutdowns. You will see increased utilities. You will see all of this. And we've we've talked about this for quite some time. But in the midst of all of those different things, the biggest thing to fear is Amos 8.11. That in the end time there will be a famine, not of bread and water, but of the word of God. Because people are starting to preach it. And they'd rather preach about self than they would about the word of God. Listen, if we get to the end of our lives and we realize that we have accomplished nothing in terms of success according to the world's standards. But at the same time we've laid, out our, our, laid our lives down for our brothers and sisters and laid them down for Christ as an altar, for as an offering on the altar for him. You're successful. You listen, I, I I could take my life and spend all my days in my business working and that could be my focus. Or I could realize, hold on a minute, no point in doing that and then my kids don't know about Jesus and don't have a relationship with them. Or, you know, I don't reach anybody in the outreach or, you know, I don't preach the truth, the, the truth of the word of God to anybody. Who... Or what trumpet are you going to respond to this year? So guys, uh, thanks for listening. Um, I'm going to suggest that if you're in the Belfast area, you do get and you want to hear um, the prophetic message. Because we've got more to share and a different stuff to share um, about what's coming up in the 5783. Get down this Sunday at half 11. If you're not, get online and watch us if you can. Uh, California is having issues right now with power grid. Got this breaking news last night. The outages, and with that, I believe they're re start rotate rationing power soon here in the US. I think that Germany is already talking about this rationing the power, and, and uh, I think uh, I think it was Kelly who told me earlier um, about them telling you you can't charge your electric cars um, in the state in America. You can't charge your electric cars. You have to. Uh, stop charging your electric cars and at the same time they're putting restrictions on buying uh, petrol or gas cars you know it's crazy I'm going to ask you guys just as you as we're finishing here I have this nerve in my tooth right now I know I need a root canal I will not go to the doctors or the dentist because I like I said I believe that they're <laughs> not that they're evil but what they do ugh. Um, but I'm going to ask you, if you can, just please, for a second, just pray for me. Um, I can feel the pain right now, and it's increasing, and it's coming over my eye. So I'm going to just ask if you can pray. I will probably have to go to the dentist, but I'm hoping that I don't. So uh, please, just reach out your hands, take a second, and just command it to go in Jesus' name. And I'm going to pray for each and every one of us. So, Father God, I just thank you, Lord, that your spirit is 
emanating and hovering above your people, waiting for your people to speak out and let that fountain become an overflow just to, 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 to impact the people around him, the atmosphere around him, Lord. I am speaking strength into your people, not strength based on their own ability, but their ability to lean on you, to not acknowledge uh, their own understanding, but in all their ways acknowledge you. Father, we say that right now, Lord, we ask that the, the 83, the pagan male, the, the Holy Spirit inspired speaking, the, the ability to speak out and proclaim truth, to speak to the mountain, see it uprooted and cast into the sea, to see the miracles that we've all longed to see, that we've seen in part that we want to see more lord you have shown me so much throughout my life that i've seen people healed of disease of injury of catastrophe and disaster and i've seen those miracles in my life but lord i'm saying right now in jesus name show us more give us more overflow as we bend before you as we come before you knowing that we are weak and meek before you knowing that we are unworthy lord touch our lips with coal awaken in us an ability to actually proclaim truth with new invigorated power lord we are saying right now lord examine us dig on in us dig out those things that shouldn't be in there take out those things and uproot those things that are restricting our walk and lord examine us and lord use us as a vessel as you pour more water in ephesians 5 18 fill us daily with your your spirit lord fill us daily with your spirit so that it overflows lord fill us to the overflowing brim that tomorrow when they go out tonight today whenever they're going out and speaking to people that your works that your power that your holy spirit that your rock hakadish follows them goes before them and it just it just clears the path and use those miracles to turn people to the truth and father we say that we are this year refusing to respond to the trumpet of self no fear induced sound will will cause your people to go and to go off to the right or go off to the left but rather we will respond to the shofar that you have commanded that we will gather together we will gather together and we will fill to the overflow in the brim and uh, overflow with your water, with your spirit, and that will emanate through us. And Lord, we want to see you in the midst of all of this of what's coming. We want to see you, your glory in Jesus' mighty name. That even like in Acts 2, when they gathered together and they humbled themselves in the upper room, Lord, that is what is happening right now. We are humbling ourselves and we are saying, Lord, you have your way in us. And Lord, even try and cause shaking, Lord, keep us. Us resolute concentrating and walking in the spirit, walking in the gemel, walking in the spirit, knowing that you are where our eyes are trained and our hearts are trained in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hoping it stays like this. I'm going to declare that it does, but all the pain is gone. So I'm going to also say, Simon, I don't have to put on my big boy pants. Ha ha ha. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I might regret that if it comes back, but all, at this minute, praise Jesus, all the pain is gone. I can't feel anything here that's hurting, so praise Jesus. Please de keep declaring, and I thank you for that. And I am saying that you are blessed, highly favoured. You are children of God, and this year we are responding to the shofar call. Amen? So, guys, God bless. Join us on Sunday. And, I, you know, guys, I'm going to suggest, see if you've got friends or family in the local area or even online, invite them on Sunday. So if you've got them and you can get them down to Belfast, please do. If you've got them online, invite them to listen online because this isn't about bombs on seats. This is about people being equipped for the dark times. So as darkness com covers the people and deep dark or darkness covers the land and deep darkness the people, Isaiah 60 the commission upon us is to arise and shine for a light has come. So I'm asking you, if you can, invite people down, get people down, let them hear the message. I don't care if they believe in Jesus or not, right? That's not my job. Jesus and the Holy, the Holy Spirit will pull and direct people to it. But you be a missionary. And if you're online and you're in a different country, be a media missionary. So guys, God bless. Call you highly favoured and blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.